Welcome to podcast number five in our series, Colonies to Colossus, The Rise of a Giant. In this podcast, we'll take a look at the founding and settlement of the New Hampshire colony. The northernmost of the 13 original colonies, New Hampshire was a remote frontier colony that never developed a large population. For much of its existence, New Hampshire was under the political control of neighboring Massachusetts, These facts largely explain why New Hampshire remains such an obscure colony compared to most of the other colonies, yet New Hampshire made significant contributions. In the 1770s, as tensions mounted between Britain and her colonies, New Hampshire adopted a written state constitution months before the Continental Congress adopted the Declaration of Independence, making New Hampshire the first of the 13 original colonies to adopt its own written constitution. In the late 1500s, England began to look seriously at the potential offered by the New World. Emboldened by the defeat of the Spanish Armada, wealthy English investors and promoters began to remind England and its leaders of the profits that could be made from setting up their own colonies where they could find precious metals just as Spain had done. After all, why should Spain be the only country to profit from the New World's wealth? One wealthy Englishman who had influence with the royal court named Walter Raleigh, had spent a personal fortune promoting colonization in the New World, and his efforts led to the establishment of the Virginia colony. Further north, another Englishman named Humphrey Gilbert was promoting the wealth that could be had at the eastern tip of Canada called Newfoundland and in New England. These areas had inexhaustible fishing grounds, and there were already English, French, and Portuguese fishing boats harvesting the wealth of the sea there. In 1602, an expedition was sent from England to explore the New England coast. This expedition brought back a big cargo of sassafras, which was used in tea and medicines and other purposes, which more than paid for the expedition. The following year, another expedition was sent out, hoping to bring back the same wealth. And this expedition explored the Piscataqua River which is still the river between Maine and New Hampshire today. They were hoping the river would lead further inland and lead to the rich fur trade with the Indians and possibly even finding precious metals. A few years later, in 1607, colonists arrived in what is today the state of Maine and set up a small colony. That colony didn't last for barely more than a year and was soon turned into a ghost town as its settlers left under the harsh conditions there. Due to political and religious turmoil in England, no further efforts were made to colonize or explore the New England coast until the 1620s. In 1622, land grants were issued to Captain John Mason and Ferdinando Gorgias, two friends and business partners who were interested in settling and colonizing the New England area. The following year, the first permanent settlers came and arrived and set up a settlement in what is today the state of New Hampshire. In 1629, Gorgias and Mason split their grant. Gorgias got the area that is today the state of Maine, and Mason got the area south of the Piscataqua River, which is today New Hampshire. Mason named the area New Hampshire after his family estate in England, which was located in Hampshire. In 1635, John Mason died, and there would be lingering problems with the grant that was made to him. Occasionally, his heirs would pop up, demanding that they be given ownership of the colony of New Hampshire and even threatening to kick out the settlers that had come there to settle. Further difficulties arose because the land grant overlapped with the grant that was given to the Massachusetts Bay Colony to the south. In order to fend off these attacks from the Mason heirs, the leaders of New Hampshire went as far as to forge a fake Indian land grant to them that predated the grant made to Mason. And in fact, this phony forged land grant was so authentic looking that for the better part of two centuries, it went undetected as a fraud. All of the details about Mason and his family and heirs and their ownership claims to New Hampshire is probably one of the colony's most tedious features. I've tried to keep the details to that to the bare minimum because it is a little bit boring. Nevertheless, when Mason died, New Hampshire consisted mostly of just a few autonomous towns and little fishing hamlets that were probably seasonal and temporary in nature. It's very likely that many of the people in New Hampshire did not even know that the name of the place was New Hampshire. In the 1630s, 
people from neighboring Massachusetts began migrating into New Hampshire. These people were mostly Puritans, or they were people with Puritan outlook who had maybe been cast out of Massachusetts for having different views. It was natural that there would be a conflict with the people that were already settled in New Hampshire because most of them were Anglicans or members of the Church of England, and they had very differing views of each other that were not good. The Anglicans looked at the Puritans as religious zealots, and they applied the New Testament epithet, scribes and Pharisees, to describe them. On the other hand, the Puritans looked at the New Hampshire people and saw the rowdiness and the drunkenness that went on in the taverns and in these towns and saw them as ungodly and in need of God's word. This led to turmoil and religious upheaval. And in fact, there were some riots and even violence over this. During one riot, a person had a halberd, which was a long pole with a large axe head at the end, and he secured a Bible to it. In another case, a man named Stephen Batchelor, who was a 80-year-old minister, was dismissed from the ministry because he had tried to seduce his neighbor's wife. So the situation in New Hampshire at this time was very unstable, and there was a lot of religious turmoil. During the 1640s, Massachusetts Bay Colony to the south, by slow degrees, literally took over the government of New Hampshire. Enough Puritans had moved there that they supported the takeover. Part of the reason the takeover was allowed to happen was because that England was too preoccupied with important events happening internally. England was involved in a bitter conflict between the king and parliament, which would result in a civil war and other religious ferment as well. For the next almost 40 years, New Hampshire would be part of Massachusetts. The takeover, however, had some positive results. It did provide some stability in their government and it did help protect many of the settlers' land claims, especially against Mason's heirs who occasionally from time to time showed up demanding that they be paid for their land. But still, many of the colonists, original colonists from New Hampshire, weren't always thrilled about having Massachusetts take over with its Puritan outlook. The Massachusetts government did provide some leniency in order to get along with the Anglicans there, but many Anglicans and others were shocked at the punishments that could be dealt out to even other Protestants. For example, three Quaker women which showed up there were tied to the back of a cart and carted from town to town and whipped at each town because it was illegal for other Protestants to be in Massachusetts territory. One of the valuable products, or the most valuable product that New Hampshire exported was lumber. In fact, by the year 1768, almost 12 million board feet of lumber were being shipped annually. The wood went to making barrel staves, shingles, and ship parts. Probably the most important single item that New Hampshire provided to the British Empire were the tall white pine trees. These trees were ideal for making ship's masts. In 1679, the heirs of John Mason were successful in petitioning the king to separate New Hampshire from Massachusetts. And the kings were generally, whenever they weren't distracted at home, very willing to try and clip the wings of Massachusetts. They always resented Massachusetts's independent spirit and its defiance of royal authority. So in 1679, the king did make New Hampshire a separate colony. Now both Massachusetts and New Hampshire shared a governor, but each colony had its own separate legislature and officers. This caused resentment among the local Puritans who still wanted to be under Massachusetts government. And many of the local officers resented being ordered around by royal officials. There's one somewhat humorous story that occurred in the 1690s. Lieutenant Governor Usher was attempting to organize the militia, and one of the local militia officers was not happy about this. A local resident who witnessed the event wrote that this militia officer quote, turned his britch upon the lieutenant governor, pissed in his presence, and let a fart, unquote. So there was some unhappiness with that situation. In 1741, the king went even further and made New Hampshire a royal colony so that now that it had its own governor appointed by the king, it was completely separate and autonomous from Massachusetts. 
A man named Benning Wentworth was selected as the first governor of independent New Hampshire in 1741. He would serve as that colony's governor until 1767, making him the longest serving royal governor anywhere in the 13 original colonies. No sooner had Wentworth become governor when he found that New Hampshire and New York were in conflict over territory that we call the state of Vermont today. Resolving that conflict never occurred until after the American Revolution, mostly because the French and Indian War prevented it from being solved. In 1767, Benning Wentworth was succeeded as governor by his nephew, John Wentworth. Things had settled down in the colony since the furor over the Stamp Act in 1765, but colonial resentment towards the king, his governors, and parliament still simmered below the surface. After the Boston Tea Party in 1773, royal authority in the colonies began to deteriorate rapidly. Without troops to enforce their orders, royal governors could only rely on the militia, but the militia had joined in the opposition and were often part of the mobs that opposed the governor. In New Hampshire, an assemblyman and militia officer named John Sullivan, who would later go on to be one of General Washington's trusted officers, was a leader in the opposition to the king and the governor of New Hampshire, John Wentworth. One of the things that infuriated New Hampshire's colonists was that the Wentworth family dominated colonial government by dispensing land and offices to friends and favorites so that they would be mutually supporting. In June of 1775, a mob armed with clubs came to arrest a guest dining at Governor Wentworth's house. The governor refused at first to turn the man over to the mob, but after the mob aimed a cannon at the door of his house, the governor gave in. That night, the governor and his family fled to the nearby fort for protection and soon left New Hampshire, never to return. Before Governor John Wentworth fled the colony of New Hampshire, several of the legislators, members of the Colonial Assembly, had set up a provincial congress. This provincial congress pretty much assumed the reins of power once the governor fled. They immediately began urging the Continental Congress to give them some kind of direction. Their situation was a little bit precarious. Unlike the other colonies, New Hampshire had no royal charter. The existence or legal existence of the colony existed because of the governor's commission, which came from the king. Otherwise, it had no technical, legal, discreet existence. In December of 1775, the Provincial Congress began working on a constitution, which they adopted the following month. In a sense, this constitution, which was the first that any of the colonies or states produced, and it was many months before the Continental Congress adopted the Declaration of Independence, this state constitution amounted to a Declaration of Independence from Great Britain. New Hampshire had taken quite a bold and daring step as the first state to really do something about independence. New Hampshire was a small colony, but she was never short on producing leaders or leadership. It was New Hampshire that took the first substantive steps towards independence by adopting their own written constitution before any other colony or even the Continental Congress did. And it was New Hampshire that provided hard fighting and reliable leaders during the American Revolution. For further reading, I recommend the following books and articles. Colonial New Hampshire, A History by Jerry R. Daniel. Controversies Between Royal Governors and Their Assemblies in the Northern American Colonies by John Francis Burns. The American Colonies from Settlement to Independence by R.C. Simmons. And A Model for the Coming American Revolution, The Birth and Death of the Wentworth Oligarchy in New Hampshire from 1741 to 1776 by James Kirby Martin. Published in the Journal of Social History, Volume 4, Number 1, Autumn 1970. I also highly recommend the fictional television miniseries called Courage, New Hampshire, 